you think. That's a habit you should not get into, Colette. Anyway, so the last time I was here, we looked at Abraham, uh, we didn't look at Abraham, so we looked at Genesis 22, verses 1 to 22, and we looked at the story of Abraham and Isaac, when Abraham had to be so obedient to God because he was asked to sacrifice his own son. He was asked to sacrifice his own son. Huge thing he had to do. And we got into the life of Abraham and it showed, you, it showed us what the obedience to God is all about, what obedience to God is all about. And what obedience Abraham showed. So that was on top of um, Horeb, top of the mountain of Horeb. And we're going to carry on this little theme of uh, what happens in the hills of the Bible. And this morning we're going to be going into uh, 1 Kings 18, 16 to uh, 18. And we're going to concentrate on verses 16 to 40 this morning. Again, we're going to see not just obedience, but we're going to see what hope is does as well. So if you've got a Bible, please turn to 1 Kings chapter uh, 18. And what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to read the first, fair, first 40 uh, verses, just to put context into what we are going to be doing uh, later on this morning. So if you have a Bible, let's turn to uh, 1 Kings 18 and we'll read verses 1 through to 40. I'm reading from the ESV this morning. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab. I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. And perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself and Obadiah went in the other direction by himself. As Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognised him, and he fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go, tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? <clears throat> As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my lord has not sent to seek you when the when they would say, he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation, and that they had not found you. And now you say, go and tell your Lord, behold, Elijah's here. As soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you, and I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he will kill me, although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. As it not been told by my Lord, then I did what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah's here and he will kill me. And Elijah said, the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab, Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two opinions? How long will you go limping between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood. Put, it, put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. 
and you call upon the name of your God and I will call upon the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourself one bull and prepare it first for you are many and call upon the name of God, of your God and put no fire to it. <clears throat> and they took the bull that was given them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered, and they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon Elijah mocked him, saying, Cry out, for he is a god, either is musing, or is he away relieving himself, or is he on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be wakened. And they cried out, they cried out aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two seers of seed. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water, pour it on the burnt offering, and on the wood. And then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal, let no one escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. And may the Lord bless the public reading of his word to us this morning. Lengthy reading, but important, very important. So we come to Mount Carmel. We come to a place where we see one man put his complete faith and trust and hope in God. Indeed, this man's name means Yahweh is God. So just by using his name, just by calling out his name, you are declaring that God is God. There is only one true God. Just by using this man's name. Of course, we're speaking of Elijah. But who is this man? Where did he come from? Where is he going? Now, we just can't pop into this passage without looking at a bit of history behind or putting a bit of context into it. Because here's the thing. See, if you take the text out of the context, what are you left with? A con. So let's put things into perspective here. Let's put them into context. Elijah first comes into sight in the previous chapter. Chapter 17 sets out the scene for what's about to happen on Carmel. Elijah's first words are not words that are tame and easily forgotten. Let me quote these first words. So if we turn the page, chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God, as the sorry, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except by my words. Well, that's what you call an opening statement, is it not? That's setting things out, if you will. That opening statement was caused by the then present king of Israel, Ahab. Allow me to read to you chapter 16 and verses 29 to 33. We're still in context here. Okay. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab the son of Omri became, began to reign over Israel. 
And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as, and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He created an altar to Baal in the house which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than any other, than any of, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So now you know, Elijah's statement is definitely what you would call an attention gate. You understand that's why that statement's made now. So we're told there had been no rain for three years. Why no rain? Ahab, because of Jezebel, worships Baal. It was said that Baal had authority over rain. Things start to click here. This is God showing his power. This is God showing his power here. Right? No rain shows Baal to be impotent. But we also see that Ahab builds a share of poles. What's a share? A share apparently was the goddess of fertility and motherhood. So they're another tick box, really? This is what you're worshipping? So we have a nation whose king's been turned away from God by his own wife, who now worships a non-existent God and a lump of wood. That's basically what's going on here. This statement, therefore, by Elijah is the opening salvo by God to show the futility, and I mean the futility, of the nation's following of a weak and inept leader. He is weak and inept. So as we move into our chapter today, which we've already read, we see Elijah in the third year is told to go back to Ahab because God is now going to bring back the rains. He's going to bring back the rains. Now we're for three years of drought and with drought usually comes famine and we're told it's severe famine. Now the head of Ahab's household is Obadiah, the general manager if you like. Or if you remember a certain program, this is Carson. He's the head over uh, the household. He's an important man, very important man. Okay, so we've got Obadiah, okay, is told by Ahab to go off in a certain direction and find water and pasture for the animals. He's on his way and he meets Elijah. Obadiah knows who Elijah is. Indeed, he falls on his face. But this has nothing to do with Elijah and everything to do with God. You see, when Obadiah looked at Elijah, he saw God. This was God's man. So when he saw Elijah, he wasn't going praising Elijah. He was praising God. That's what he was doing. That's what he was doing. Everything to do with God. Now we're told Obadiah fears God. He's a believer. He is a believer. So when he sees Elijah, whom he knows is God's prophet, he falls on his face and he's worshipping God. Obadiah is a man of God. It's clear here he hid 100 of God's prophets from Jezebel who wanted to kill them. He took a risk. A big risk. Yeah. You can only imagine what would have happened if he'd been found out. It would not have gone well for him. And now poor Elijah, or poor Obadiah, thinks he's in big trouble because he's been told by Elijah to go and tell Ahab that Elijah's on his way. Just remind you of verse 9. What does it say again? Just a quick reminder. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the land, into the hand of Ahab to kill me? Obadiah's panicking. You do, if, if he'd been there, you wouldn't have blamed him, would you? You would not have blamed him. To cut a long story short, he fears that Ahab and Jezebel, when they find out what they find out what he did with the hundred prophets. Okay? You can imagine what's going through his mind. What have I done to deserve this? Really? I hid your own men. I hid them from her. Now you're sending me by. What if they find out? They're going to kill me. He's scared. He is scared. There's a good chance they're going to kill me just for passing on the message. Gee, thanks, Elijah. 
But just before we get into our passage, I'm going to concentrate on 16, verses 16 through to 40. In verse 15, Elijah reassures him that the Lord will not let anything happen to him. Not directly, but through implication. So now we get into the passage. We'll set our context. And what a passage it is. What a passage it is. We have seen the faith that Abraham had in God when he was told to sacrifice his son the last time I was here. Right? Today we'll see another example of absolute faith and hope where anyone of hundreds of people gathered could have and probably wanted to kill Elijah. So this morning we're going to look at two things, possibly. There we go. We're going to break this down into two. The world rejects God and secondly, Elijah's faith in God. What we're see in this passage is faith and hope in the extreme and God at his most explosive. Now, this is where I test the age of some people. Well, may you smile, Ronnie. I liken this passage to the rumble in the jungle. Ali and Foreman. Uh, there's plenty of people here that are old enough to remember it. Right, 1974, October 74 in Kinshasa. I liken that. I liken this passage to that. Now, for those of you who are old enough, I can see your faces and I can see what you're thinking. Where on earth is he going with this? Something that happened thousands of years ago and he's linking to something that happened in 1974. Well, I'll explain later. It'll become clear, I'm sure. So, our first... You move it on for us, guys. This is not moving. So, our first point this morning... Thank you. Um, the world rejects God, but let's be more specific here. The world rejects the living God. The living God. We see that challenge come directly from Elijah in verses 17 to 19, but it's also Ahab who sets the tone here by calling Elijah the troubler of Israel. But why would you talk to him in such a way? The actual word is, the Hebrew word is acre, which means social outcast. Why would you talk to a man in such a way? Well, we already know why. Because Elijah prophesied a drought for three years. And guess what? The drought happened. So as far as Ahab is concerned, this is all Elijah's fault. This is all done to you, Elijah. Elijah bats it back straight away to Ahab. No, 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 no. It's you that's the problem. You chose to reject God. You married Jezebel. You allowed yourself to be turned away from God. No, this is done to you, Ahab. Nobody else. This is you. Now, I know Jezebel's not mentioned directly, but she is by implication. And Elijah's not finished here. Oh, no, no, no. He brings Ahab's father into the fray. Your father is just as bad as you. Now, that's got to hurt. That has got to hurt. Telling someone how evil, bad their father is. Now, Elijah doesn't miss and hit the wall here. Not at all. Ahab's problem, and man's problem in general, is that we don't like the truth. We don't. We don't like the truth. Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 20, is even more explicit in what he believes of Ahab. And I'm going to read it to you. Okay, this is what he believes of Ahab. And you'll find it in chapter 21 of 1 Kings. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, I've found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. See, Ahab knows he's in the wrong. So by calling Elijah names, he's trying to deflect the guilt that he's faced with. Altification, okay? He's not just sold himself, but he sold Israel down the river. So let's start slagging off Elijah. It's the last vestige of a wrong to start throwing insults. That's when you know you've got somebody as a Christian. The only way they can answer you back is to insult you. That's when they've got no response. That's when they're faced with the absolute truth of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Certainly that. So if you're a Christian here this morning and you tell people what you are, you're in the workplace or whatever, and all they can do is slag you, they've got you. You've got them. Because they've got no response because they can't stand the truth. And that's the truth of it. The Apostle Paul explains it. Just that he gives us an apt description of our world today. And you'll find it 
In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, and I'm going to read them to you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and and the unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Ever since the creation of the world. If you can move the slide on for me, please. Since the creation of the world. And the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honour him as God, or gave thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of God, the glory of the immortal God, for images resembling mortal man, and birds, and animals, and creeping things. The world has a lack of trust. The world has a lack of trust in God. And we're about to see how little Ahab and the nation of Israel trusted God. Remember, Israel was God's chosen nation. Now, Elijah is not just setting a challenge to Ahab. He has set the challenge to the whole nation of Israel. The whole nation of Israel has been set the challenge. And we see the challenge in verses 19 to 21. Firstly, Ahab tells, uh, firstly, he tells Ahab to bring the 450 prophets of Baal with him and the 400 priests of Asherah. And Jezebel's brought into it again just at the end of verse 19. She's getting the blame. It's she who is leading her husband here. In verse 21, Elijah turns and points his finger at all gathered, not just Ahab and his wife. He's telling them to get off the fence Make a decision. Who are you going to follow? Could you put on the next slide for me, please? Who are you going to follow? And that same question comes about a wee while before this. We can go back into the book of Joshua, in verse 24, in verse 14b through to 15. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonite in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the challenge in a nutshell that's happening here. That's the challenge before them. And it's the end of verse 21. They couldn't answer that challenge. They couldn't say anything. They could not say anything. Either they didn't want to, or they knew they would have to admit that Elijah's right. That Elijah's right. And that highlights a huge problem for mankind. We hate to admit we're wrong. We don't like admitting we're wrong. Move on to the next slide, please. Matthew Henry sums it up perfectly in his commentary. There can be but one God, but one infinite and but one supreme. There needs but one There needs but one God, one omnipotent, one all-sufficient. What occasion for addition to that which is perfect? And that's the same challenge that ensues today. The 21st century, it's the same challenge. Who do we serve? Who do we serve? We've made up our own gods. That's Baal worship. We've made up our own gods. We are more worried about pleasing the world than we are about God. It was Billy Graham who said that we're also worried about making sure that nobody is insulted or prejudiced except God. Elijah is challenging the fact that they are putting their trust in false gods. And that challenge will show itself shortly. I like verse 22 because Elijah starts to love them lull those gathered into a false sense of security. I'm only one against 450. What can possibly go wrong for you? You know? What can possibly go wrong for you? He has to show them how futile their worship Baal is. Elijah is boxing clever. Now the rope dope begins. The rope dope will be explained shortly. But now the rope dope begins. 
The rules of engagement are now set out for both sides. Both sides have a bill to sacrifice. They both have to prepare it, prepare it by laying it on the wood. Then each in turn to call upon their deity to bring down fire on the bull. The sacrifice of the bull is clever by Elijah. It's very clever. Remember, all these people come from a Jewish upbringing. So they will understand easily what's going on. Plus, it's also believed, this gets worse for Baal. It's also believed that Baal can control fire and lightning. No, just rain. So he's not been able to produce any rain for three years. Well, will he be able to produce liar, uh, fire and lightning now, one wonders? So how can you lose prophets? How can you lose the prophets of Baal will call upon Baal and Elijah will call upon God? A simple test. Easy. It's now from verse 26 to 29 we see the rejection of the living God openly take place. And this is where my boxing analogy comes out. The rumble in the jungle, the rope of dope came to the fore. Now for all you Gen Z's, you're all probably wondering, what's the rope of dope? Well, this was a clever strategy by Ali against Foreman. Foreman was probably the hardest hitter ever in boxing at that time. So Ali thought, I'm going to struggle against this guy. So what did Ali do for round one, right through at the very end of round seven? He just lay in the ropes and let Foreman batter lumps at him. Energy sapping punches were being thrown in Ali's direction and Ali just lay in the ropes here, soaking it up round by round by round. In fact, it was said if he went even beyond the eighth round, he probably wouldn't have lived to see the end of that day. That's how hard Foreman was hitting him. So that's a rope of dope. Ali's just laying the ropes and Foreman's just battering lumps at him. Energy sat and punches are being thrown and Ali's soaking it up. Body shots, head shots. His kidneys and livers are taking an absolute pounding. The Bales think that they have Elijah on the ropes. They're throwing wild punches. Always, you know, throwing punches always. Body shots, head shots. They think they're picking off Elijah bit by bit. But are they? But are they? Elijah may be on the ropes, but he's still jabbing, still probing the defences. In verse 26, oh, Baal, answer us. Verse 27, the jabs are going in. Elijah is taunting them. Let me remind you of verse 27. Let me remind you of it. At noon, Elijah mocked him by saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's musing, or is he relieving himself, or is he on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep, he must be awakened. He might be in the toilet, he's a God. He's relieving himself, he might be in the toilet, he might be having a kip, really. Excuse the vernacular, but that's what we call ripping the mic. He's taking them apart by that sentence. He's taking them apart by that sentence. In verse 28, they now start throwing wild energy satin punches. They're like whirling dervishes trying to get a response and nothing comes from it. In verse 29, they're ranting and raving. They even start to cut themselves. As Wiseman in his commentary states, to elicit the pity or response from Baal. It's now time for Elijah to end this match. It's time to show how impotent Baal is. And this takes me to my second point, if you could move us on, please. Elijah's hope and faith, or faith and hope in God. The Baal prophets are done. They're done. There's nothing left in any of their punches. There's nothing left, but there was nothing, anything to offer in the first place, was there? There was nothing to offer in the first place. From verses 30 to 40, we're about to see God at his most explosive, but still boxing clever. Elijah says, enough is enough. Round seven's finished. I'm now moving into round eight. Ding, ding, seconds away. Round eight. This is where it really hits. This is where it really hits. His jabbing is going to be more pronounced, very much more targeted. Next slide, please, guys. In verses 31 to 32, he is repairing the altar using 12 stones, which signify the 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. Not only does he rebuild the altar, he also quotes Genesis 32 and 28. Israel shall be your name. Israel shall be your name. 
reminding them of not whose they are or what they are, but whose they are. They are God's chosen nation. They are God's chosen nation. The jabbing is finding its target now. But the haymaker punch is coming. There's one more thing in Elijah's mind, and that is fraud. That is fraud. Now, what do you mean fraud, Paul? Elijah wants no doubt in anyone's mind as what is about to happen, as what's about to happen. He wants to make sure they know exactly whose presence they will be in. No half measures here, none. Once the altar is built and the bull's placed upon it, he gets those around to fill four jars of water. Now, I'm not sure how much water was held in each jar, but the trench he dug, according to the research that I've done, held two sears of seed, so about 15 litres. Okay, but he's done this three times. So you can imagine the amount of water that's been used here. Okay. This is where any doubt of fraud will be eliminated. Three times they do this. The wood for the fire. The bull is drenched in water and the trench is overflowing with water. Okay. All of this to ensure that no one can accuse Elijah of trying to sneak a burning ember under the bull. That's what he's up to. He's making sure no one can say, ah, we know what you did. Place is absolutely soaking. So if you're there, you must be thinking there's no way a fire's going to start. Everything is sodden. He seems to be loading the dice against himself. Does he know it? He does. Next slide, please, guys. So now we see Elijah's faith come to the fore, and it comes to the fore through prayer. It comes to the fore through prayer. Next slide again, please, guys, if you don't mind. Okay. Verses 36 to 37. Okay. 36 to 37. Let me read it to you. Let me turn the page, actually. It'd be helpful. And at the time of the offering of oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. You have turned their hearts back back. His prayer could not be simpler. He did not spend hours ranting and raving. He simply put his prayer before God. Firstly, all gathered know and understand that there's no other but God. And secondly, the nation of Israel repents. As Matthew Henry states, return their hearts back to God. He wants two other things here. God's activity in nature and his activity in the history of Israel. And this faith comes in action. Remember Genesis 22, 7 and 8? I'll let me read them to you again. Genesis 22, verses 7 and 8. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they, so they went, both of them, together. See, Elijah's in the same place as Abraham here. He's all in. He's all in. This is all about God. He's going to absolutely do what God needs him to do. He's all in. Everything that he is, he has placed his hands. He's placed in God's hands. Remember my boxing analogy? Elijah has thrown his last jab. Now, the final haymaker is about to be landed and show the glass jaw of Baal. God answers the prayer in the final blow. He comes off the ropes. Baal has nothing to offer. He can't fight back. He has no defence. The punch has landed. Boom! The haymaker. This is the eighth round where Ali's on the ropes and he's getting punched left, right and centre. And he just stands up and went, is that all you've got? Well, that's what's been said. That's what's been said here. That's what Elijah's saying. Is that all you've got? Well, the haymaker punch has now been landed. In verse 38, God sends his fire down. He burns up everything. The burnt offering, all the wood, the stones that made the altar, the wa all the water in the trench, and even the dust around the altar too. It's all burnt up. 
This is God that he's most explosive. Never count God out. And in verse 39, the people realise this. They immediately supplicate themselves. In other words, they got on their face. They've seen God use nature on the sacrifice through the fire and they remember who he is to them in their history. You can't get a clearer picture or example of God answering prayer. In verse 40, we see what happens when God is rejected. This is not a wanton act of slaughter. No, it's not. It reads it, but it's not. It's not. There is a price to be paid for the rejection of God. There is a price to be paid for the rejection of God. To reject God is to accept sin. God is just and perfect, and he can't have sin before himself. He can't. So Elijah wants the people to return their hearts back to God. But for the sacrifice to work, for the sacrifice to work, something else has to take place in the hearts of people. Not just then, but also now. Next slide, please. That something is repentance. And that brings us right up to date. To right here, right now. It also brings us to a sacrifice made in another hill. Not with a bull this time, but a man, the son of man, the son of God, Jesus Christ. That same offer of repentance is right here and right now. It's right here, it's right now. Elijah has pointed out the sin in us all. We are all sinners in this room. I certainly am. But the sin can be removed through repentance. It can be removed through repentance. A clean start is an offer. And what is required is an acceptance on our part. That we are sinners. That Christ's sacrifice is on the cross. That Christ's sacrifice on the cross was for our sin. That he came to bring us back to God. One day to stand before our maker, clean and pure, free from the sin that has so held us back, held us all back, to be the person you should be, to be that person you were created to be, not the one the world would want you to be. Let me finish with this question next slide, please. Who will you choose to serve this day? Will you place your hope in the world? which will not put itself on the line for you, or place your hope in Christ. Place your hope in Christ, who died for you and to have your sins removed. Last slide, please. I end with this. Who will you choose to serve this day? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you gave us Elijah and you showed us through him your power and what it is to be your children. We thank you, Father, the hope that Elijah had in you. He stood out, I am yours, I am God's, I am a child of God. So, Father, this morning we pray for open hearts, open ears and open minds to your word this morning. We pray that someone will come this day, Father, whether in this church or in any other church in this world that you have created, and they will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour this day. Bring these things before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just invite the uh, praise band to come back up who will...